You have now arrived at your destination. Luke, this is such a joy to do. I had so many great things before the show. I so enjoyed our chat before the show. So thank you so much for having like the time to come on the show. And I really appreciate you joining me. So thanks, Harry. Thanks for having me. Not at all. I want to start there. You've got a pretty fascinating background. So I want to start with how you made your way into the world of some of the most powerful growth orgs with the likes of Facebook and most recently Shopify. And what was that entry into growth for you? So I originally started as an entrepreneur, kind of bouncing between product and growth for a really long time, which I think is pretty common for a lot of growth people. I originally started building my first product when I was 21. I built a travel blogging network called TravelPod that I sold to TripAdvisor. And when I did TravelPod, I really focused on building the best product in the world and not on growing it, which you know had its, its own issues uh, later that I discovered. But what happened was during the acquisition process with TripAdvisor, the CEO of TripAdvisor, I remember he was asking these really deep technical questions like, what are your meta tags? What, what does the SEO configuration look like? How much traffic do you get from different sources like Google or Google Images? And I was really thinking, why is this guy, the CEO of TripAdvisor, asking so many technical questions about SEO? And this is you know, quite a while ago and back when SEO was a dark art and growth in general. But that's a moment where I realized how important growth was and really realized that building a great product is important. But if you don't have a strong growth loop for it, it doesn't matter because you can't scale the product. So from that, that was a pretty pivotal moment for me and one where I really started focusing on viral loops and SEO and paid search and funnel optimization to grow the products that I was building. So after TravelPod built a Facebook app called the Travel IQ Challenge that grew to about 100 million users on the Facebook platform. Also built a travel photo product called TripWow, which grew to 65 million users. Those products were, were very much about viral loops and, and, and growth on the Facebook platform. After that, moved on to growing uh, TripAdvisor itself, which was mainly about SEO. We built a pretty sophisticated SEO growth engine and grew TripAdvisor to be the largest uh, site on the internet, travel site on the internet, uh, which was a ton of fun. Um, after that, went on to advise a bunch of companies. So I worked with Pinterest, uh, Patreon, Twitter, and shared some of my, my growth playbook with them. And kind of through that, got connected with Mark at Facebook and you know met with Mark, had a 15-minute meeting that turned into an hour meeting and really hit it off, frankly, and uh, had a, a great chat. And you know, originally, he was trying to convince me to come down to California to work at Facebook. I was in Canada. Wasn't uh, all that... Um, not not so much interested, but it was a difficult leap to to make uh, to leave Canada. So it took a while, uh, and you know had a a long kind of discussion with him. He the experience was actually pretty Im, Im, like it was quite the experience. We flew me out to California with my wife. We had dinner with him and his wife, and we ended up playing uh, Oculus Rift all night actually. And this was before the Oculus was released, so it's pretty cool. So I was you know just really having a good time there. And I remember after doing that, he just kind of pulled an envelope out of his pocket with an offer. And I flew back home with an offer to join Facebook and eventually ended up leaving Canada, coming down to California and working at Facebook. Can I just unpack a couple of things here? Because there's yeah. so much and I don't want to lose like strings. First uh -huh. off, before we touch on Facebook, you mentioned the viral loops that were actually core to the early products being so successful. Just so we understand, I think viral loops is kind of thrown around as two words a lot. What is a viral loop and what makes one work and be efficient? Yeah, I think of the a viral loop as basically where you have users on your product that are doing some kind of behavior that's inviting other users to come and register on the product. That's at its simplest level. You can have the best is when the core product itself has a viral loop. For example, a photo sharing product. Uh, using a photo sharing product and not sharing it is not uh, a very useful product. So the, the loop, the viral loop is baked into the product itself. You can have kind of secondary loops baked into it, but ultimately it's about users who are on your product inviting other users to potential users to come and use your product and convert. So there's different ways of doing this. It can be uh, challenging and, and difficult to get right, but when you do get it right, it can lead to some pretty exponential growth. What are the most prominent viral loops at Shopify? It's something we're we're constantly working on and iterating on. One of our our best sources is through recommendations. Uh, our merchants love Shopify, and they mention Shopify to their friends, and other merchants come in and and join through that loop. So we're 
we're always iterating on making it easier for merchants to do that. But it, because we have such a great product and one of the uh, highest cited reasons for joining Shopify is that somebody had recommended them in that it's, again, it's kind of part of the, the core product where uh, it would be hard to do if you didn't have a great product. But so for Shopify, it's, it's, we can start off that great baseline and it's, it's an area we're constantly iterating on. Now, you mentioned Facebook there. I, I do have to unpack this incredible journey that you had with Facebook. When you look back on that time, I, I love that playing the Oculus Rift uh, story. But when you look back on that time, what were some of the biggest takeaways for you from, from spending the time you did at Facebook in such a pivotal moment for the company? Yeah, it was an interesting time for the company. I was uh, hired to uh, grow the product in, in different ways. Some of the biggest lessons that I took away from that were were things that I had already done, but <clears throat> is something that I continue to keep inside the playbook. It's that not to look at growth or even product building as one specific thing. To grow your product, you can look at it in terms of SEO or paid loops or viral, but it's also about M&A and building entirely new products. So for example, I had a variety of teams at, at Facebook, but the one that was the biggest win for us was building Messenger Kids and engaging an entirely new segment of the population and by building this kind of uh, safe family messaging product. So it's, it's, it's about thinking growth, thinking about growth broadly and really thinking about all the different ways of growing. I, I totally with you there. Can I ask, when you think about also the advising that you said there, you mentioned some of the companies you've worked with from your Patreons to your Coras to your Twitters. When you think about commonalities between what made them so good, are there commonalities that stand out to you when you reflect back on those experiences advising them? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few things that come to mind. The probably main commonality would be around the... We're advising a company where there's a, a lot of success with the product and where there's a good engagement is that when the growth teams themselves are very curious, and very humble and open to being wrong, which is not the case uh, for all growth teams. But certainly when you have an advisor uh, relationship with a company is very important. And uh, some companies have done extremely well with this. And and advising is a, actually growth is an interesting thing where it may take 15 years to learn something and you know 10 different experiments but you can communicate it very quickly. So it's, it's, a, it's a unique relationship with a company and the ones that I've seen work the best, the commonality would be uh, teams that are just constantly questioning assumptions, open to being wrong, very curious. And that's, that's something that I've seen work really well. I think the humility that comes with that understanding is also just in, in a mutual understanding of what growth actually is. And it means a lot of things to a lot of different people, I think. So if you were to kind of put on like a, you know, like a fridge magnet, what is growth? What, how would you define growth today? Just so people have a shared understanding. Yeah, it kind of goes back to my comment um, from my takeaway from Facebook. I, I start with the outcome. What is it that you're trying to do? What is the number one metric or, or activity you're trying to, to create as an outcome? And then what is then it's all the activities and the, all the different approaches that can lead to that, that growth. So I don't define growth very crisply in terms of it's this one thing. It's basically whatever it takes to move that one um, metric you're trying to, to increase. So I know it's, a, it's kind of a broad answer, but it's, it's reality and it's um, it's how I've approached growth in general. No, listen, I love that, but I'm going to pretend like you're my advisor for a hypothetical startup in this conversation. I get you. Yep. So it's about moving that one metric. Luke, how do I know what's the right metric to choose? This seems like an awful lot of pressure. How do I choose the right metric and how do I know that I've got the right North Star? Yeah. I mean, you ultimately want to find the one that has the highest impact for the company. That'll be different in each case. So for Facebook, it was um, daily active people engaged on the product. At Shopify, we care a lot about getting as many merchants to be as successful as, as possible on the product. So it comes down to how does the product work? What's the most important lever? And then making a very opinionated decision over this is the one thing that matters. And this one thing, if you get right, the flywheel that it kicks off will lead to a lot of growth in the right ways for the company. So how do we think about attacking that in terms of the growth teams? Because the other big question I find is like, do you integrate growth teams into product teams, into marketing teams, or do you have standalone growth teams like you had at Facebook? How do you think about advising founders when it comes to standalone versus integrated? Personally, I find that it works best when it's standalone. It really comes down to 
who you're able to hire to bring on the team and uh, the skill sets that that person, because that's the constraint. The, the constraint is going to be that who can you find to lead the team who's epic and what are their strengths and how can you build around that person? That's, that's generally how I'd start. But I do find it works better when the growth org is standalone and that you put as many functions as possible within that, that growth org. The, um, the bottom line is they're going to have to work either way with the product team. And uh, it's just a really important relationship between the product team and the growth org. But growth has its own culture that it needs to, uh, it needs to build. And it, it does operate a little differently than a traditional uh, product org. So I, I prefer to have it separately. It can work in many different ways. There is really no cookie cutter. This is how growth works. This is how product works. It depends on a lot of different variables, but I've seen it work best when it's separate. Okay, so it's separate. Um, I know that I actually really want to focus on this and have it as a priority for me as the founder. Do I hire a junior growth engineer and we start small and A-B testing, or do I go for a big stellar growth leader and build a team around them? How do you advise me there? Well, I generally like to hire as senior as possible. Um, you want to bring in somebody who's had a ton of experience. Growth takes a really long time to build intuition around, <clears throat> so you need to have done a lot of experiments, tried a lot of different things. And growth is a lot about pattern matching. So what, what have you seen work? What are you seeing in the data? And then how can you use your intuition to build other, um, other tactics that'll move the needle? So I, I try to go as senior as possible. That's not always possible because one of the problems with growth is that there's, there's, there's a limited pool of talent in the growth uh, sector. Uh, so that, that is probably the constraint that a founder will run into first. So one other approach, if, if the ability to hire somebody very senior is not possible, then you can hire somebody who's a bit more junior. But in that case, I would surround them with uh, a set of advisors. Agreed in terms of surrounding them with a set of advisors. Now let's think about the hiring process now, because we know that we want to get these people on board. But bluntly, I've never hired a gross professional before, so I have no idea how to do it, Luke. How would you literally structure the process for hiring this as senior as possible growth person to join the team. What does that process look like for you? Uh, this is an area I spend a tremendous amount of time focusing on. In fact, you know, as a growth leader, what levers to pull knowledge is all important, but if you're building a team and you're not a single person doing growth, the impact of your team will be the most important thing. So hiring and leadership become the most important um, skills in that case. So it's a craft in and of itself that I certainly spend a lot of time refining. Uh, so the process itself can, can vary, but the way I do it is I try to look for uh, what I call signs of excellence. So past performance is the best predictor of future performance. So what I look for is what signals indicate past behavior and success that would be predictive of, of future success. So that's like the rough scaffolding. Um, so ideally you want signals that tell you that they're they're the best. So one signal, for example, uh, I remember when I, a long time ago, when I started building teams, really sat back and looked at, well, what, what are the signals that somebody who's amazing would, would be highly correlated? And one that, that I use is that when I meet with somebody, I'll start at the bottom of their LinkedIn page and kind of get them to walk me to the top. And I just listen and, and ask questions along the way. And one thing I'm looking for is, you know, motivations for leaving a role. What, what did they accomplish at each role? But one signal that doesn't come up all the time, but is, is just a great signal is when somebody's leader left a company and went to another company and came back to get them. And if you think about the social dynamic that, that takes place there, the only person that, or one of the only per, uh, people that really knows how good a growth leader is, is their, their leader. And they have left the company and have taken the social risk to come back and, and take that leader with them. So to me, that's such a great sign of um, that this person is is high talent. So that's one signal I look for. Uh, I love ex-founders. I love people who have uh, shown a, a certain degree of grit and had uh, repeated success. So it's not that they've been successful once or lucky. They've had a, a pattern of repeated success. That's one thing I look for. But my slam dunk is very trusted back channel. Uh, somebody who's recommending this, this person that I'm evaluating. Uh, without any caveats, I do find when a recommendation comes with, you know, they're great. But uh, you have to be careful because sometimes people are trying to tell you something without um, maybe telling you the, the, whole, the whole thing. So great people usually come without caveats. Three signs of excellence and a sense of, you know, would I enjoy working with this person because it's such a critical role. But those are my three 
my three slam dunk uh, things that I look for. And I have a kind of series of questions that I also ask to, you're basically trying to get a set of signals that tell you this person is really, really good. And there's a few ways to do that. Well, what are those questions? Because my, my trouble here is like often people work in Facebook's growth team and clearly it's a fantastic growth team and it achieved a lot, but I don't know the difference in attribution between individual and team. What questions do you deliver to really tease out individual performance and quality of candidate? So for me, I try to get a sense of how deeply they understand the craft. Um, were they just executing a playbook they took off the shelf? Uh, if they're, if this person's from Facebook, they'll have a very specific set of knowledge because they're supported with a lot of scaffolding at Facebook. Um, so you really want to get a sense of how, how deep did you go and how well do you understand the craft? So one, one question I love to ask is, I'll ask, tell me something I don't know about growth. And it actually doesn't matter if they tell me something that I, that I already know. What it does though, is it forces the person to dig into their, their knowledge and their experience and pull out the one thing they believe is the top of the stack in terms of this is something really clever or really, you know, I know this, I experimented this, I learned this. And it lets you kind of anchor their knowledge in terms of they come up with something really good. And even if you know it, it gives you a sense of, oh, wow, they, they actually know that. That's, that's really good. Um, so that's my favorite question. So you're really trying to get a sense of do they really understand why certain things work? And you can ask other questions like, um, I do like asking a question and then just following up with a, a long string of whys to see if they truly understand what's happening. Uh, and that'll give you a sense of you know, how quickly does that fall apart? If you ask why and, you know, you know, weak answer, like, can you go extremely deep down the knowledge stack to see if they, they understood it? And to me, that differentiates a good growth person from a truly exceptional growth person, somebody who understands all the levers, because that deep understanding is what will let you use your intuition to launch new experiments and drive new growth without having to, to run another set of experiments. You can use that intuition to drive an experiment that you know 80% will, will work because you've, you truly understand the mechanics of the levers. Totally with you in terms of really digging deep on the why. In terms of the actual process, again, I, I have no idea. So I find this candidate, I have the first interview, they seem good. What next? Do I do I do like a test with them? Do I in integrate them into the team? Like literally, what does that actual meeting by meeting process look like? Well, the first meeting, I, uh, like I mentioned, I would start at the bottom of the LinkedIn page, walk it to the top, look for signs of excellence, ask some tough questions, try to get a sense from that first meeting. Do they truly understand growth? What have they done that's exceptional? Usually within 20 minutes of that meeting, I, I'll know, am I... Am I, how aggressively am I pitching this and trying to get you know, as much signal as possible? If the call ends and I don't have enough signals to suggest that they're really good, the call might just, that might just end right there. That might be the last call. Uh, a good meeting where I get a sense of like, this person actually has some, some pretty good signs. The next step would be, I would go to my network and back channel. Uh, back channels are, are, are pretty important to me. Uh, at this point, you should really know if you get um, a couple back channels and you're getting a strong signal and you see signs of excellence and you've got a, a good sense of what they've done and that they actually understand the levers, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty good at this point. <clears throat> you also should get a bit of a sense of whether you'd like working with them. If you still don't know, you can go off to ask them to do, some, uh, to do a test. Uh, I have done this, not always because sometimes candidates won't want to do it. Um, and it really depends, you know, how well have you sold the role? What is their current situation? How much do they want the role? Uh, so I'd say in a smaller percentage of times, I get somebody to do a test, but also growth people are in uh, very high demand. So, you know, many times candidates, if they're not really interested in the role, um, may, may just choose not to do the test. So, so the test isn't a, a thing I always do. I have done it. It's usually if I've got some you know, I'm just not sure about this candidate. I want just like, I don't have the back channel or, you know, the, the person's been in one job. They've been at Facebook the whole time. Can they actually survive outside of Facebook? I want a little bit more color, but um, that's generally uh, how I do it. On reflection, where do you think most founders go wrong when assembling their growth teams when they're hiring? I mean, the biggest mistake you can make as a founder is hiring the wrong person for the role. And I guess it's related to what we were just talking about. It is very hard to get a sense of if the person is any good. 
uh, it can be obviously very costly, both in terms of time and money to make the, the, the wrong mistake there, uh, to hire the wrong candidate. Um, so I think that's, that's the biggest mistake. Now, it's, it's very hard to sniff out top talent. So that makes it exceptionally hard. I'd say some common mistakes would be, and this is something that's unique to growth, is that in growth, some of the signals that may suggest that somebody's amazing in a different discipline might not apply to growth. I'll give you an example. In most professions, if somebody's at a company and they're promoted very quickly, that would be a good sign that this person is uh, you know, exceptional. In growth, because there's so few people in the space, it could suggest that they're exceptional, but it could also suggest that maybe they were the only person available, the only person this company could hire. Um, there was a lot of historical knowledge. There's different reasons because there are so few growth people in the market uh, that um, there's a few other, you know, there's other reasons with growth why somebody could be promoted, which so it can be a bit of a counter signal as well. Um, another mistake I've made is, well, I've seen founders make um, is sometimes the the, Social media halo uh, or public speaking halo does not correlate with ability. Uh, so I've seen people make hires for people that are you know on the stage often and great speakers and great evangelists. That doesn't always translate to somebody who's who's great uh, as a growth person. So I think when it comes to that, you really want to not again not just look at what somebody's um, doing on social media or public speaking. You want to look at what they've done, what teams have they led, what impact have they had. Uh, and do a lot of back channeling. That, that's another mistake I've seen made before. I, I totally agree with you in terms of the loudest microphone doesn't mean the highest quality candidate. Can I ask you this? Should I bring in the head of product into some of these interviews? Should I bring in the head of marketing? They're obviously going to play a crucial role in working alongside them. Should I integrate the team into this process or or actually do it myself? We definitely want to integrate it with the, uh, the, the product and marketing teams, especially because the relationship between product and growth will be, and marketing, uh, will be critical because growth and, and product are so intertwined. There'll be work that the growth team will want to do that'll affect the product. There'll be work that may potentially, if it's done the wrong way, negatively impact each other's goals. So that relationship needs to be super tight. The relationship between the CEO and the head of growth and the head of product, especially the head of product, and the head of growth are two of the most important relationships. Can I ask, as a founder, what can I do to make that relationship between my head of growth and my head of product, what can I do to make that as tight as possible? I think bringing them into the interview process and making them part of the selection uh, team is, is a good start. Um, making sure that you know these, these two individuals have to uh, be meeting regularly have a good understanding of each other's goals and and work in a, a very kind of collaborative way. It's a bit of it's a bit of an art. I don't think you can kind of tell both people to to work well together, but having them work closely together, be aware of each other's goals. Um, As a growth leader, should I push for growth teams to be included in all product reviews? You know, I've seen it work so many different ways, Harry. Um, I've seen it, <laughs> you know. In some companies, yes. In other companies, no. It's worked. It's worked well. Why? In, why, in, why did it work in some companies and not in others? I think in some companies, it depends on the way the company is structured, how teams work together, how cross-functional the 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 products that are being built are, like how integrated into the the rest of the product it is. Yeah, I've seen it. It work work both ways. So, in if you can carve out surface areas, and I think this is this is important. I think. Ideally, you want the growth team to own all of the services that matter the most to growth. Uh, that's that's the ideal state. Senior leader, multi-disciplined, uh, they know how to do engineering, they know how to do growth, they know how to do product, and they have ideally all these functions, these, sur these surfaces um, as part of the, the growth team. So they don't need to sit in, inside of another product team's reviews because they, for that specific, for any work happening in that surface, because they own the surface. Where that's possible, where you can actually carve it out, that's very important and that allows the teams to run independently very quickly. So there's less of a sitting on, on different teams' product reviews in that case. Where the surfaces are owned by all owned by a product team, then yes, the growth team should be very embedded and reviewing all the work that's being done. Question for you, and sorry, I'm I'm really asking the tough ones. <laughs> I'm just too interested. You know, growth teams often like go into code bases. Cool 
tinker around, A B test, and then fuck off. Uh, like, how do you ensure that growth teams have the ability to test and iterate without pissing off growth teams, uh, without pissing off engineering teams building sustainable, reliable, durable code? Uh, it. So there's a few ways. First, if the the relevant surfaces are owned by the growth team, that that becomes less of an issue. Um, and then ultimately it's through a collaboration with the product team. So, you know, at Shopify, we work very closely with the product team day in and day out and make sure we have, um, we, you know, we have reviews across both teams where there's overlap and we involve them as part of the process for the build so that we make sure that there's, there's trust being built. It's when there's no trust that the whole thing falls apart. Uh, which is why it really comes down to keeping different teams involved, keeping them in the loop, building trust through uh, making sure you keep uh, different teams and different uh, priorities in mind. And you're not just going in and lowering the quality bar. That's a common, I think, failure state where you build something that moves the needle, but the quality is terrible. It looks awful. It's bad for the other team's goals. It's bad for consumers. That's a failure state for growth. So, so there's, there's a few ways to do this, but ultimately it comes through with relationships and trust that are built through um, working together and just showing this ongoing ability to build products in ways and, and growth optimizations in ways that doesn't affect other teams negatively. Luke, how do you structure growth reviews? How, who sets the agenda? Who's invited? How long's the meeting? How often are they? Help me understand what a growth review looks like and what a good one looks like. This is something we're always iterating on. We tried a variety of different. It depends on the size of the team as well. I mean, a growth review is 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 not really needed when you're a, a you know maybe a two person growth team, but ultimately you want to look at. And it also depends at what stage. If you're at an early stage, you want to look at what do we, just get buy in on. Hey, here's here's the kind of work we want to do uh, from a growth uh, optimization perspective. Does that make sense? Uh, we call that the proposal stage. And then when you everybody's aligned, then we do a review around the the metrics, the opportunity size and make sure that um, we all believe that, you know, this is building the best thing possible. And then, so there's there's kind of a, an evolution of growth reviews. So it's, they're not all made the same way. Ultimately, they should be very driven around metrics and um, opportunity size, and also a strong conviction around what we think will work. Uh, but it really depends on the, on the stage of the review. Okay, so we have a project and it hasn't gone that well. How do you, as a growth leader, prevent morale deterioration across the team when a project doesn't go to plan and it doesn't work? Well, one, one project not working doesn't generally tank morale, but it's when there's like a series of them. So there's a few things that are, that are important. And I've seen this in a variety of, of different areas, especially with new products that are looking for that growth lever. Um, because you can go through a period of just iteration and, and learning. So there, there's a few ways to do this. I think one is you do need a culture of grit. You need to uh, have strong leaders that can keep the team together through those those phases. I think it's important to celebrate all of the wins, even the smallest of wins, and to really focus on the learnings, even though it might take a while to unlock certain levers and you have to have that grit to get through it through a series of failures. But reframing, it's not so much a failure, but if something didn't work and you've learned from it, that is also success. And you have to talk about it that way, recognize it that way, and build a culture that that celebrates that. So I think there's a um, there's some strong leadership required through those phases, uh, but I, I do think it's important not to frame failed experiments as failure as long as you're learning and it leads to an unlock that's even bigger. And that that happens quite often. How long should one give new projects before determining whether it's a success or failure? You you never want something to be too long and it drawn out, but you also don't want to cut something off before you have enough data to know whether it's a success or failure. How do you think about enough data to determine conclusion? Talking about projects, not people? Either or. I mean, let's do both. Okay. So <laughs> projects... Uh... When you run out of like, six months is a good chunk of time. If you're not at, at exiting six months with a sense of, okay, we have some levers, we see we see line of sight into some levers that that could move the needle for uh, an individual product or or project. Uh, if you can go six months without any hope or inspiration that something's working, that's uh, that's probably a sign. Um, you know, it can be longer, but generally six months is probably a good a good milestone. 
even if it's not about unlocking the growth, but just having learnings that are uh, suggesting that there, there are you know, better wins to come and giving you hope. In terms of people, I think within three to six months, if you have a new leader coming in, they should be able to demonstrate some something that gives you a, a sense of whether you made a good hire or not. We like to say that you know the best people come in and leave a, an impact greater when they land. So they, they get hired, so everything around them gets better. So within, frankly, 30 to 60 days, you should have a sense of whether you made a good hire and they've either hired in their, their best people, the best people become kind of talent magnets. They pull in the best people with them. Within you know three months, they should have an early win. Um, the speed of experimentation should, should increase. So within the first few months, you'll get a sense of whether you've made a good hire or not, and it should be pretty obvious. What are some big red flags in those first 60 to 90 days? If that's like the things that they could do well, for me as a founder of hiring my first growth leaders, what should I be nervous about or look out for? There are many. <laughs> the, uh, the two that uh, come to mind would be, first is speed, I think is very important in growth. The cadence and velocity that you can experiment in and, uh, and you know, push new code out and, and run things is very highly correlated with your ability to be successful. So if I'm not seeing the speed and progress within the first few months, I would be, or hearing a lot of excuses, I would be pretty nervous. That would be a red flag for me. And you kind of hinted at this a few times earlier around product teams, working with growth teams, and how do you structure them and have them working together? Because of how cross-functional growth can be, if there's tension in the first few months between the t either the teams or the new growth leader, and the product teams, that's that's a, a red flag. And, and that 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 can go sideways pretty quick. So I'd look for early tension. How are the relationships working out? Um, is this new person coming in with a sense of humi humility, asking a lot of questions? And um, that can go sideways pretty quick. I would, you know, speed and velocity can be improved. Uh, a relationship falling apart can be completely dysfunctional and just cause the whole thing to fall apart. What's been your biggest challenge in scaling the growth org at Shopify, Luke? I mean, it always comes down to to the team, to building an amazing team. I wouldn't say it's it's a uh, it's a challenge we're having. We we're, we built an amazing team. I would say Shopify currently has has some some of the best talent in the world uh, doing growth, uh, but it's always something I spend a tremendous amount of time uh, focusing on. And it's one of those spaces. Growth is one of those things where if you make the right hire, it's not a you know 0.5 percent increase. It's literally a you know, a, a 10 or 100 uh, X increase. So that's the area, I don't know if I'd call it a challenge, but it's the area I focus a lot of time on and also the area that literally making the right decision can be just a game changer for, for growth in, in all aspects. So if you look at whether it's in paid search or in um, funnel optimization or an SEO or in product building, or we have a, a product org and an engineering org inside the Shopify growth uh, org and um, just bringing in amazing talent is, the thing that matters the most. So that's what I spend uh, the bulk of my time on uh, when I'm not in reviews and, and uh, getting my hands dirty with the teams. Uh, so that's, that's the most important thing. Uh, I don't know if you classify it as a challenge, but it's, it's definitely the, the area that has the most impact at, 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 at my scale, at the scale that we're operating at. Where do you think you're weak as a growth leader, Luke? Hmm. Well, I think it's always a challenge staying high and then going in deep. I do love getting my hands dirty. Uh, I really, really enjoy that. Uh, and, you know, as the team grows, that becomes harder to do. And so it's that that trade off of how do you stay at the very high level and then zoom into all the different areas. That's that's a skill I'm always working on. Um, that I think I'm OK at, but I'm not. Uh, it's something I'm always uh, looking to improve and, and get better at. I, I, I totally agree. I, I think with founders, actually, for me, the, the best founders have the ability to move from the 5,000 foot meta vision to like last Wednesday's Facebook ad spend and how it converted. So I totally agree yes. with you there. Can I ask, yeah. when you think about getting, no, sorry, you go. Well, a subtle tweak to that as well is that, you know, how do you do that without completely deflating the team? Uh, because there's a way to go in and engage with the team and have, you know, get right on the, on the beach and, and, with, with, with the troops and do a lot of work to make things better, but uh, done in the wrong way, it can be very disempowering for the team. So there's, there's an art to how you stay high, empower teams, hire the best people, uh, be involved, but also give them space to execute. So it's, it's an art, it's definitely an art.
You said there about kind of getting hands dirty in the data, in the trenches there. Can you talk to me about a decision that you made without data and how did it go? So I think data is very important. And especially when you pair it with like a pattern matching off of previous experience. So I know, for example, uh, so I focus a lot on, on what is the thesis that this experiment is likely going to work? What are the signals that you have that suggest that this experiment is going to work? Just throwing things on the wall. So you start with the data. What is the opportunity size? Is this worth doing? And then you try to look for signals in a, in a thesis that will increase the likelihood of something working. So I remember one situation at a past company where uh, somebody on the team wanted to make a change to the website to see if it would impact SEO traffic. And I asked them why. And they said, I just want to throw things against the wall and see if it works. That is a bad answer. A better answer is, I did this experiment. It had this result, which would suggest that if we do these two things, because we also saw a competitor increase in the search rankings based on a similar change, that we'll likely see um, a positive impact from, from this experiment. So, so lack of data is not good. You certainly want to start with a good data foundation, but equally important is what is the sound logic behind the thesis that will make sure that this works? And that's something that um, I think probably doesn't get spent enough focus on in terms of validating not just the data of the experiment, but the thesis behind it and what are the signals and building up that stack of signals that we know those are, those are so valuable in growth. When you build a set of, we call them levers, essentially, a set of levers that you know will work or experiments that, that didn't work, you build this intuition over time. And uh, I think that's frankly the most important part of growth because it increases your hit rate as you're running experiments. It's so interesting you say that because Bangali Kaba, uh, formerly of Instagram, who I, I know well, and then obviously Casey Winters, uh, formerly of Pinterest, who I'm sure you know, um, they both actually said that like past intuition has been detrimental to their performance because they've relied on previous experiences expecting them to create the same outcomes that they did before. And actually, it impacted their mindset in the wrong way moving forwards because it was different products, different circumstances. How do you think about not letting past experiences negatively impact how you think about future growth projects? Because it could be totally different. Yeah, I think there's a few few things you have to do. One, you have to constantly test your, your knowledge. It's one thing you know now may be different in a different context. And also I think it's important not just to, un not, it goes back to really understanding what's going on. So if an experiment worked, that's just knowing that experiment worked is interesting, but may not be repeatable. The most important thing is understanding the why behind it. Why did it actually work? It goes back to some of my interview questions. Uh, it'd be, oh, I don't know if easy is the right word, but it would be say like, easy for somebody to give me an answer that uh, of something they've done that's worked well. But it's a little bit harder to dig through, you know, five wise deep to find out, well, why did, why did this work? And why do you think? And once you know the root knowledge behind it, that's more transportable than the actual um, experiment uh, result itself. So, uh, but I think it's, it's valid that you need to constantly retest these assumptions and retest these uh, experiments. But um, counter to that, once you understand the, the, the deep knowledge of why something works a certain way or why a certain algorithm works another way, I mean, I've certainly... Um, seen cases where you can apply that very quickly uh, to, to, to produce wins. And uh, it's usually a really good starting point. You come in with your playbook, you execute the stuff that you know will work. And then the things that don't work, you just reassess your base knowledge. That's constantly evolving, but you should have this set of knowledge, the, the deep, true understanding of what's going on. Um, not so much that when you make, you know, you change X to Y, that creates a lift. More importantly is why does it create a lift? And how, and how can you continually do that going forward? Can you talk to me about a specific growth decision that didn't go to plan? And why didn't it go to plan? A growth decision. Can you define growth decision? Uh, so it could be we decided to focus on uh, button color changes, or we decided to focus on a specific uh, referral program for LATAM. And actually, we got it wrong. Um, it could be we decided to 
implement a Twitter recommendation for usernames um, where we suggested your username and we thought that would reduce friction and barriers to entry. And actually it didn't. It just created usernames that people hated. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sure there's tons. Uh, like, because it's usually, especially at the beginning when you start a new lever, there's a, a huge failure rate. So when we were working on TripWow, uh, this viral photo sharing product, one of the things we learned was that it was a viral loop, uh, but also it was, um, it, was, uh, it was a consumer product. And like most products, whether it's SaaS or consumer, the funnel really matters. And we spent a lot of time reducing friction, which is a, a common growth approach. You want to reduce friction and you want to increase motivation. In fact, that's one good mental model that I like to think about products through is that how do you reduce friction to use the product? And what is the intent of the user coming in? What is their motivation to use it? And those are two levers you can play with. What I, what I found was that we'd run a series of experiments to reduce friction from, from the sign up page, from the home page. And that had or originally at the beginning had a lot of impact, but you basically bottom out. There's only so much friction you can reduce until it just stops having impact. So, uh, and to answer your question specifically, you know, I think we did seven iterations of the homepage and after you know, three, we saw a lot of impact, but then there was very much diminishing returns to whether it's button colors or changing the UI or adding free to the button. Um, it just, you get to a point where you've just removed enough friction proportional to the intent of the users coming through and removing more friction is not going to move the needle. So that's, that's actually a good, going back to lessons learned from historical testing, that is one lesson that I think is important to take forward, which is there's there's a there's a bottom to how much friction you can you can remove from the flow and it, you know you can spend a lot of time doing experimentation there that doesn't move the needle at all. I I totally agree. I actually had Scott Belsky on the show say the devil's in the default when it comes to product and growth. Being just accepting what is is where the devil lies. And I I don't know. I ruminate on that because I'm like, well, users like what they know and they like consistency. How do you think about that devil in the default in terms of kind of product design and growth understanding? I interpret that, I think, in, in a few different ways. So I'm not sure what he was getting at. But I mean, certainly defaults for a product can have a, a massive uh, impact on, on growth. It uh, depends on what you're trying to achieve. But, um, but def removing friction and defaulting user behavior through, through an interaction with a product will have a, a, a big impact to how the product um, grows. I'm not sure yeah. if that is exactly what he's talking about, but. No, no, I, I get you totally. I do want to dive into my favorite though, Luke, which is a quick fire round. So I say a short statement and then you give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Sounds good. Okay, so what tactics have not changed over the last five years in growth? Um, there's there's a lot that haven't changed. They've 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 changed a little bit, but they're still they're still valuable. So one is certainly SEO is still it's changed a lot, but it's still a very uh, big fire hose of traffic and conversion that you can get. So SEO is is a is a is a good one. I think like the tried and true funnel optimization work or just product optimization of um, making a product easier to use, getting users to a delightful moment in the product as fast as possible. Those principles haven't changed, and that's something that. You know, even though some of the channels have changed, doing work to uh, optimize onboarding or exit flows, that 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 type of work has, is still very uh, very valuable. Um, and then you know, paid channels in general have become more important because a lot of these services, a lot of these engines like Google are moving away from showing organic results and showing paid. So paid certainly paid search, for example, works very well. And um, uh, it's still a very large channel that has to be part of anybody's strategy. Tell me, what tactics have died a death over the last five years? Over the last five years. So I think it, SEO is an area that I've spent a lot of time in. And one that comes to mind is, and you can put it under a wrapper of black hat SEO if you want, but basically SEO that used to work, um, but was essentially against the Google guidelines. <laughs> that is, it, it's not, it's not worth taking that risk anymore. It, it doesn't really work anymore. The algorithms have gotten so good that in many cases it doesn't work. I know it's still possible, but it's just not worth it because uh, you can get penalized and your entire business can, um, uh, can be out the window. Frankly, you can entirely ruin an entire domain uh, because of that. So I would highly recommend founders to stay away from that. That's something that I don't know that is, is broadly known by all founders, but it's a question you should definitely ask anybody doing SEO in your teams, any of your growth leaders. That uh, is no longer valid and can um, 
can you know, destroy businesses. It has destroyed businesses. So Tell me, what, well. what would you say is the biggest mistake that founders make when hiring growth teams other than hiring the wrong people? Oh, I mean, not empowering them. Uh, growth teams need engineers. They, uh, I, I like using growth tactics that rely on engineering approaches so rather than using a, uh, you know, a bunch of spreadsheets to come up with uh, changes to make and, and doing analysis, but building algorithms and, and systems to scale uh, growth solutions. And, and you really need engineers to do that. So I think it's really important to give growth leaders the engineering uh, capacity to, to execute uh, quickly. Um, I also like to say you need your, your growth leader to be as close to the sun as possible. You don't want to bury it too deep in the org. That's a mistake I've, I've seen done uh, before. Um, because if there's something really critical to the business, that is a, a, a decision, perhaps a controversial decision that needs to be made. Sometimes a very time sensitive decision that needs to be made. You don't want it to be six layers from the CEO. You want to have a, a short loop there. Um, so I think those are some mistakes that some founders can do. I've seen Tell that. me, what, what one piece of advice would you give a growth leader today entering a new role? I'm really big on focus. I think focus is the number one lever that you can use at any point and have immediate impact by stopping the work on things that don't matter and starting to work on, on, on different work or work that, that does matter, that will move the needle. So I would advise a growth leader, very quickly find out what your North Star is, find out what is that one thing that will be impactful for the business. Get everything on your team rallied around that North Star and then stop doing all the things that don't matter. That is the, to me, that is the most important thing because it will increase the likelihood of, of having the right kind of impact very quickly. And it's growth is something that can touch and move every lever and every metric in the company. So there's always this demand for, hey, can it grow this part of the business or this part of the business? And deciding which area that we'll be focused on and that the teams will, will focus their energy around uh, is extremely important, harder than it sounds. And I think, uh, you know, an important part of leading growth is probably saying no, you know, once a week or at least once a month to something that doesn't align with that North Star. So it's very quickly determine the North Star, rally the team around it and start showing wins as fast as possible. Luke, I am your CEO. You are my head of growth. What does a good relationship between us look like? How often should we meet? What can I do to be the best CEO for you? So I've seen this work in a variety of different ways. There's different types of CEOs with different DNA. Um, I, I think you want the, the distance between the CEO and the head of growth to be quite short. Uh, if I were designing from first principles, I would say the head of growth reports to the CEO, meets weekly, and is uh -huh. flagging issues and also discussing potential you know, strategy changes and approaches at a very high level. That said, I've also seen it work where head of growth reports to the COO or the president or um, or another executive, uh, CRO potentially. So it can work in, in different ways, but in either of those scenarios, with the, the CEO and the head of growth need a very tight relationship and uh, ideally be meeting weekly if possible. Luke, what would you most like to change about the world of growth today? I think one of the biggest challenges with growth is there's not there's a small talent pool in growth there's not a ton of people doing it and there's a variety of reasons for this uh, the schools aren't really teaching it uh, at scale yet um, also to learn growth the most valuable thing is that and this is this is probably a good signal for for founders to look for the best way to learn growth is to have a lot of of reps to, to have taken a lot of shots on goal because that's the best thing you can do to inform um, your playbook, to inform your knowledge, to inform your intuition. And there's not a ton of companies out there. There, there aren't an infinite amount of companies that have that scale where people that are practicing growth can learn that high-end growth and really become experts. So what you end up with is uh, a small number of people who have that experience and who know what works and what who actually know what works and what doesn't work because there's just um, only so many companies where they can they can build that experience at. So what I would like to change is to grow the talent pool and have um, uh, just more people in the industry who are, who are good and who are sharing the knowledge. I, I totally agree with you in terms of expanding the talent pool. I want to finish with actually one of my favorites, which is like, well, what one company growth strategy other than Shopify uh, have you been most impressed by recently and specifically why? 
The uh, one company that I'm, I'm an investor in, uh, it's called Bounce. And I was really impressed with their growth strategy. One of the reasons I invested was because they've been very good at their growth loop. And it's everyone in the company from the founder uh, to, to everyone else very much understands it. And, you know, I've been an, an advisor for, for a long time. The one thing that it goes back to a lot of things we've talked about today that I was very impressed with this company is their, the way they leverage advisors and have surrounded themselves with people that can help them learn and how they've been uh, just incorporating that knowledge and iterating on their, their growth loops through, uh, through what they're, they're hearing. So I think that's, that's something I've been very impressed with with this company. It's growing really fast and it has to do, I think, with how they've really put that growth lever and their growth channels throughout the bloodstream of the entire company, everybody in the, in the company and how they've leveraged uh, advisors. I really, I actually do think more people, more founders should leverage advisors. It's probably the fastest way to get uh, wins and get knowledge, um, especially in this limited talent pool that, that's out there. Sorry, final, final one. What can a founder do to attract the best advisors? What can, how do they pitch it? How do they, what makes you say yes versus no? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think different people are looking for different things. Um, what I look for is because it, it depends on the, on the advisor, I suppose. Um, so, but most advisors and, and ideally you want to hire an advisor who you're, you're aligning incentives. So you bring in an advisor and you compensate them with equity. That's the ideal. I know not all advisors would do that, but that's, that's the ideal because the, then the advisor is, is incentivized in the same way as, as the founder. Um, so if you're able to find, uh, advisors that would take on, uh, exclusively equity or the majority in equity, then really you want to convince them of the, the, in the same way you would convince an investor, that's probably the right mental way to, uh, mental mindset to take here, uh, is to think about how would you pitch the company to an investor because an advisor who's coming in and taking equity is basically investing their time. That's how I think about it when I join a company is what's the path forward? What are the growth loops? Do I believe that these growth loops will lead to the scale that we're trying to build? Um, what, what are the you know valuation multiples? Where can this go? What are the comparables? Uh, one thing that I've always found helpful is for a founder to introduce me to their VCs because the VCs invested their time and I'm investing my time, uh, sorry, their, their time and money and I'm investing my uh, my time. And the logic that a VC and investor would have taken is very similar to the logic that I'm using. So, so I'd say a founder, introduce them to your, your, um, your top uh, VCs uh, and basically pitch to the advisor the way you would pitch an executive coming in and to an investor who's putting their, their money in. Luke, I cannot thank you enough for putting up with my uh, quite prying questions today. I so appreciate it. I've loved doing this and thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Harry. It's a lot of fun.